Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read my own text from a book titled Intimacy Exposed, Toilet, Bathroom, Restroom, edited by Javier Fernandez Contrera and Roberto Zancan and published by Head Geneva in collaboration with Spectre Books. The toilet is the fundamental zone of interaction between humans and architecture. Today we can imagine buildings without almost any of the other elements of architecture, but not without the toilet. Ram Kool has wrote in the Elements of Architecture catalog for the Venice Biennale. From an architectural perspective, the history of toilets in domestic spaces is not as long as one might think. A hundred years ago, most homes did not have an indoor toilet. It was usually located in an outside shed, a private in the backyard. Although its outward appearance could be disguised, it was usually a bare wood-paneled structure. The interior was invariably unglamorous. These facilities usually had a small window and were sometimes fitted with more than one seat. In order to allow air circulation, this room was not entirely sealed off from the exterior. Its main feature, however, was that it was not linked to the sewage system. The loo itself was simply a bucket that had to be emptied regularly. Between 1935 and 1936, photographers Carl Maidens, Francis Benjamin Johnston and Walker Evans pictured backyard privies and rows of identical homes and outhouses across urban, suburban and rural America as part of the Historic American Buildings Survey. The dimensions of these small identical facilities were all roughly one square meter or less. Across the Atlantic in Italy, sanitary conditions in comparable dwellings were not so different. A good example is the plan of a casa a ballatoio or casa di ringhiera, the ballatoio or ringhiera being the gallery that provides access to each apartment, a type of popular housing built at the beginning of the 20th century. The typical plan had eight apartments per floor and the gallery always faced the back of the building, like the toilets. Every apartment had two rooms, a bedroom and a family room, and each room had a window. The family room would have a cooking area and a hearth. These 20 square meter apartments did not have indoor toilets. Instead, they would share two latrines and two wash basins along the gallery. In 1945, Federico Patellani documented the living conditions of Milanese Case del Formaggio, cheese houses. Between 1970 and 1973, for his project Milano Quartieri Popolari, Gabriele Basilico also photographed the same typology of building in Milan's working-class suburbs, and these images show that shared outdoor toilets were still a reality. Architecturally and socially, a lot has changed in order to arrive at the white freestanding bathtubs commonly advertised in contemporary magazines, or the talking, music-playing toilets with integrated bidet, common in Japan, where they are known as washlets. But at that time, only 40 years ago, the hygienic conditions of facilities in both rural and urban areas had evolved little. There has been a progressive move away from outdoor latrines. The flush toilet was invented in the late 16th century in England by Sir John Harrington, but his innovation was ignored until the late 1850s when the so-called Great Stink caused by London's untreated sewage forced the British government to start the construction of a new system of sewers for the capital city and to decree that every new house should have a water closet. Back in Italy, architect and engineer Archimede Sacchi stated in Le Abitazioni, 1886, that latrines were a necessity. 
they should be well lit, well ventilated and north facing to prevent the temperature of the small room from raising excessively. They should also be secluded and placed somewhere in the courtyard so that the entrance would not be visible from the street or the windows facing the courtyard. As a result, they were usually placed in a corner, vertically aligned around a central waste pipe or gathered in a small tower isolated from the main building. The closet was often very small, just large enough for a seat and its user. In time, toilets were connected to the sewage system, then later brought inside individual houses. But even then, the toilet was positioned on the margins of the dwelling, never directly linked to other rooms and never visible from the façade. By the beginning of the 20th century, construction manuals were pushing for the toilet to be placed indoors. In order for the toilet to migrate inside, both the floor plan of the house and the design of the actual toilet seat had to change. The floor plan slowly allowed for the bathroom to be placed closer to the living room and the bedroom. The object was made from a different material. Instead of rough cast iron, it was in smooth ceramic. It's easier for humans to accept the aesthetically pleasing rather than the ugly. This idea is explicit in Excusado, Toilets, a 1925 project by the American photographer Edward Weston. For long, I have considered photographing this useful and elegant accessory to modern hygienic life. But not until I actually contemplated its image on my ground glass did I realize the possibilities before me, Weston wrote in his day books. Here was every sensuous curve of the human form, but minus imperfections. Weston spent two weeks studying and photographing ordinary plumbing fixtures from different angles, depicting their form instead of their function. By 1925, manuals such as La Casa nell'Igiene Sociale, con note estetico-igieniche sull'arredamento, published by Istituto Editoriale Scientifico, were claiming that the latrine environment was an essential addition to the home. Health regulations of some Italian cities still allowed the existence of shared latrines, but, while financially convenient, they caused great discomfort to all tenants. The hygienic conditions were deplorable because none of the families would take on the task of systematically cleaning the facilities, and there was also the danger of cross-infection from family to family. Even the most modest dwelling, two rooms, needed to have a toilet. Italian social housing apartments built in the 1920s covered 50 square meters on average. Per capita water consumption was 94 liters per day. In a city like Milan, cesspools were still quite common in the 1950s and could also be found in neighborhoods where there was a sewage system. It took some time for construction companies to comply with new regulations, but hygiene was eventually achieved. New indoor toilets were well-lit and well-ventilated rooms, with washable floor-to-ceiling tiles and fresh clean water. All residue was permanently eliminated, including odors. Out of sight, out of mind, in theory at least. In fact, waste does not disappear by magic. It takes a lot of resources, water and energy to keep the unpleasant out of sight. Once the toilet was accepted inside the domestic environment, further development was centered around form and the liberal cultivation of the self, as the Elements catalog argues. Peter Greenaway, another Englishman, filmed 26 bathrooms, a short documentary about that number of willing subjects using the most repressed room in the English home in the most imaginative ways. For most of the 20th century, the priority for the toilet and the house in general was hygiene. 
in industrialized countries, this was generally, albeit not fully, achieved at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s, accompanied by a great increase in the consumption of water and energy. Today, the average Italian consumes 250 liters of water a day. Common toilets use an average of 13 liters of water every time they flush, decreasing between 3 to 8 liters in efficient toilets. But change never stops, the contrary is true. On the one hand, increasingly concerned about the environment, average dwellers are open to reconsider their everyday habits if this means reducing water and energy consumption. On the other hand, wellness has replaced hygiene in the context of domestic narratives, and this is pushing architects to do further research into the topic. We can expect the toilet to keep changing. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.